You know, in the 60s, there was always a confluence of people coming from the South and folks moving to the Bay Area for political purposes or for jobs. You could always hear in people from Oakland's voice that there was more of a Southern accent going on because people had more recently come from the South than, say, Black folks in the East Coast or in the Midwest or L.A. Most families had just come from the South in the 50s and the 60s. There were a, a lot of people doing, you know, what we now call funk. One of the biggest DJs out of the Bay Area got real famous, named Sly Stone. So he used his ability as a DJ to get popular and famous, and he melded all these styles. As a matter of fact, I talked to a lot of OGs from that were that were musicians at the time when Sly and them came out and they were like, oh, he was making white people music or whatever. And But now we look at that as the cornerstone of funk. I mean, similarly, not to do with the Bay Area, but George Clinton talks about that, how Funkadelic was considered white music while he was at the same time talking about how Teddy Pendergrass and all that to him is really white music. It's really pop, white pop music from the 50s just with a black singer. There's all these changing ideas of what black music is. There was a, a sound coming out of the Bay Area that was based on the political energy that was going on. I would say that was encapsulated most with Sly and the Family Stone. You, you go a lot later in the mid 80s, we didn't know who the Black Panthers were in Oakland. Me in high school, me and my friends, we didn't know who the Black Panthers were. We only found out about them through Public Enemy. Everybody, like everywhere in the United States, was trying to make music and put out some sort of statement. And who we had at first was Too Short. I remember how people felt about Too Short, how people talked about him. It was kind of like, yeah, he's good, but he's local. I remember he got on the Fresh Fest. I was in junior high and people were like, Too Short, they let Too Short on the Fresh Fest? You know, how is he on there? You know, blah, blah, blah. We don't feel like we're worth anything. So if somebody is local, that means people like us like them. So they're not worth anything either. You'll find it's hard to get support around your local group until people in your area think that somebody else likes you. Then all of a sudden you're representing for them somewhere else and that, then they support you. We're taught through growing up that we watch television, we watch television and that's the important people or we watch whatever. MC Hammer came out, he had some money behind him. Where that's from, there's a lot of speculation. Who knows exactly? Maybe it was dope money, maybe it was whatever. He was immediately able to make himself seem bigger than just in Oakland. He sold, sold millions of records. And even though Too Short came out before, he didn't, he didn't come back out with his big thing until after Hammer. But when Hammer happened, because of the ignorance of the industry, everybody's like, you know, somebody sold a million records in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Let's sign people from Tuscaloosa, Alabama and see if that works. In this case, it was Oakland, California. There happened to be folks there, like Digital Underground. Like I had gone to some Digital Underground shows when they had, uh, when they had uh, Do What You Like, and very few, it wasn't that many people there. I think they got on McCola, two first or something like that, which was the same label that had put out N.W.A. They ended up making a hit with Humpty Dance. So that even made it be where everybody was, everybody was coming to the Bay Area trying to sign folks. You know, they were just going to the local section. You know, how we got signed, we were in the right place at the right time. We had a local EP that was one of the top three sellers. It was us, E-40 and Dangerous Dame. And the label is just like, you know, just went down the line. You know, E-40 was holding out for bigger money. So was Dangerous Dame. And I was like, I'm ready to go. Something happened in, in the late 80s and early 90s that made people believe that this local music scene could do something bigger. It's funny because punk scene, they don't necessarily need that, right? Matter of fact, they start getting mad when more people like them. And that's part of their rebellion is to say, okay, we're different than this mainstream thing. At that time, the folks that were coming to shows 
were still, it was still mainly black. That wasn't the folks that were listening to hip hop, but because the folks that were listening to hip hop, if they weren't black, they came to shows if they hung out with black folks. But if they weren't black and didn't hang out with black folks, their parents weren't letting them come to the shows. That was still who was mainly buying it, but that wasn't who was coming to the shows. So I think black folks are looking for when they're listening to music, is some connection to something more powerful than them, something bigger. They don't want it to just be their block. Except for like, there's a group called APG Crew, and that's a, that's a, that's, that's an exception to the rule. APG Crew was named for Apgar Street. They had a song, they had one song that I think got on BET, I forget what it was, but APG Crew, they, that whole, Block, even before they were big, they were always talking about APG, Mellow Mar, and all these. You hear all these names from this one street of people that uh, really supported their folks. It was at a time when they knew that, hey, this is a train I could get on, this might blow up, all these folks are blowing up. But yeah, the mainstream success of groups like MC Hammer and Digital Underground is why there is Bay Area underground hip hop. The, because otherwise what happens is people get depressed, they don't do their thing, they don't, they, they make an album and it doesn't come out, or it doesn't do well and then they give it up. There was this idea overall that, hey, we could put out something and the world could hear about it. That's why labels were there, signing Digital Underground, signing Tupac. Well, you know, Souls of Mischief have that other part of the story, which was Ice Cube and their connection to Ice Cube. And at first, you know, Bay Area radio wasn't playing Bay Area hip hop. And so people knew how to get it directly to their crowds that were there. Then all of a sudden Bay Area radio started playing Bay Area hip hop and they became the one. Like now people don't, you could put out a record, put out a song, and people don't even know how to get it to the people in their neighborhood. They don't know how to get it to the people in their city because they got so used to having this uh, middleman, the person at the radio station that said they could play it or they play it, that when, when those folks stopped playing local music or like what happened in the early 2000s, all these folks that had a following like E-40 or whatever that was now getting played on the radio, they were being told by radio stations, oh, you know, we gotta be able to play your song next to a Jay-Z. Or we gotta be able to play your song next to a this or a that. Meaning, you gotta make your music sound like this. And I spent so much time in studios that a lot of people were at, where people were like, oh, here's the dude that can make music that sounds just like the Neptunes. Here's a dude that can make music sound just like Manny Fresh. It's depressing. It makes you really not, not, and you know, it's real calculated and people don't know where they're going. And this is all having to do with the gatekeepers becoming the radio. And even now with the internet, the gatekeepers are still the radio because what happens is these kids are following the trends that the radio is setting forth. And so they're making music that sounds like it so they can maybe get on that and trading videos of stuff that sounds like that or the artists that are related to the artists that the radio is playing. So it hasn't really made it more democratized. It's just, it's, it's made it seem like that. Because of a lack of history, understanding of history, they find themselves repeating steps that have already been taken when all they have to do was pivot from what Dr. King already did. Any obstacle or any form of adversity is gonna make you a better person. When you come out of it on the other side, you're not gonna wanna hear that at, at, at the front of it. Everybody should always aspire to be the person that they're not and do what it takes to become that person. There's madness and miseducation. When you're telling somebody half of the story and you're lying to black kids about who they are, you're not telling them, you know, that they come from kings and queens.